welcome uh, my friend Julie from Canada is joining us this morning. And I want to welcome, actually, yeah, I want to welcome both of you. Um, and I thank you for uh, your presence this morning. I'm so happy um, to, to sit up. Not to see you, I can't see you, but to know that you are online. Amen. All right. So we're going to go ahead and start, and I think this is not the one I actually wanted, but I'm going to go ahead and start by asking a question. Is this the end? Is this the end? I know many of you have wondered about this for the past year or two after COVID-19. Is this the end? Um, and I'm going to, I have, as we have, um, meditated upon the events that have taken place in the world. Bloods in Germany, chaos in Haiti, and hey, chaos in Cuba, fires in California, floods in China, and I'm like, well, this keeps going on and on and on. The spirit of prophecy says, in churches and in large gatherings, in the open air, ministers will urge upon the people the necessity of keeping the first day of the week the first day of the week. There are calamities on sea and land, and these calamities will increase one disaster following upon one another. And the little band of conscientious Sabbath keepers will be pointed out as the ones who are bringing the wrath of God upon the world by the disregard of Sunday. This was written about 200 years ago by Sister White. Um, okay, now I'm gonna give you a little bit of background here. Um, in this picture, we see three different um, Bible studies. Can you, um, I'll try. Jordan, you try? I'll try. You try. Okay, well, that's fine. Um, so we see there, let me give you a little bit of background. I lived in Loma Linda for almost a decade. And as I lived in Loma Linda, I had the wonderful opportunity to participate in many of these care groups. As you see in the left side, I'm with my lovely husband there. And you see Sister Christiane, I don't know how many of you were able to participate, very few of you, I think Sister Catherine and Brother Paul, were able to participate in the care group session and the care group training that she provided for about three weeks for us. So she um, started the Bible study, some of the Bible studies and care groups in Loma Linda. The Lord really blessed the work in Loma Linda. The people, the, the, the young people that would come it was multiplying so much that we had to divide into groups. And the Lord was blessing the work in Loma Linda. We loved, we felt loved, we felt safe. We felt like we would never leave California. If you see on the right hand side, that's a Tuesday night care group, and on the bottom, it's a homeless, so few of the participants of the homeless care group. And in Loma Linda, you can pick any day of the week, and there will be a wonderful Bible study going on. And everywhere you go, you felt the love and the safety yes, of all the brethren. Not only did we participate in the care groups throughout the week through Bible study, but we also did activities together, social activities. As you see, Tim and I were in the mountains. As good Adventists, we would go on Sabbath hikes. We would go on ski trips. Um, hard rock. I mean, we had so much fun with the believers. It was amazing. I had the opportunity to work at this prestigious hospital, Loma Linda University, and attended the university, Loma Linda University Church. I thought, man, I have so much fun here. I have such wonderful friends. I'm, never, I'm never leaving California. We also, not only did we participate in Bible studies and have social life, but we also celebrated birthdays. And all the time, we would go and celebrate, gather together throughout the week, go out to restaurants, call each other, make each other, get each other together. It was a wonderful time. This was by my apartment, and we were celebrating our Brazilian friend in the middle there. And those are blessed memories I have. But all of a sudden, all of a sudden, all of this came to a stop. It was the year 2020, and my husband and I were getting ready to go to our trip uh, to Japan because as good millennials, that I encourage to travel the world and see the world. We wanted to see the world, and we're like, well, let's go to Japan. It says it's a wonderful place. We're going to go to Tokyo, Japan, 
We booked our trips, everything was ready in January, and in February or March of 2020, we got the dreadful news that we had to cancel our trip because this mysterious virus had started. And not only that, but all of the Bible studies, all of the church events and activities came to an end, I mean a hold. We wondered, what is going on? We feel like this is a little time of the end. Is God preparing us for something? There were not churches open. There were no uh, Bible studies during the week. No one was calling. Everybody seemed so scared. And I started asking myself these questions. How do I prepare for the final crisis and for Jesus to return? Am I ready for what is to come? It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. Uh, do I have the Holy Spirit? Am I living up to the light that God has given me? Do I have scripture in my mind and memory? How do I prepare for the final crisis of Jesus soon return? After thinking about this, my husband and I started to pray. And we started to pray really hard because, well, I feel like there's something coming, something great coming to this world, and we feel like we need to get ready. We need to get ready. What do we do? Are we to stay in California? Are we to leave? What do we do? So what do we do? My husband went to New Jersey, and I stayed in California. We both decided, as healthcare workers, we needed to help in the pandemic. People were scared. People didn't know what to do. In the hospital, we were all dressed up, and people were afraid. But for some reason, I was not afraid. I was like, God is with me. If I die during this pandemic, helping other people, God is gonna be with me. Amen. And God took me to a hospital in which everybody was afraid. And I said, you know what? You guys mind if I pray. We were in a meeting with non-believers in a secular hospital. And I said, you guys mind if I pray. And when we prayed, I felt the peace of God and everybody was saying, thank you, Ruth. And I knew that God had a purpose for me being in the hospital. Amen. When Amen. Tim went to New Jersey, we talked on the phone, I said, Tim, I'm gonna finish this contract here, I'm gonna meet you in New Jersey, we're gonna drive back to California, and then uh, let's do what the so team is like, well, let's sell their house. We sold our house, drove back from New Jersey, get rid of everything, a three bedroom, a comfortable uh, two bathroom home, and then the Lord took us to Santa Monica, California. I'm like, okay, this is interesting. Why are we to go to, Santa Monica. It's like, well, team is like, well, they're not offering that much there, but I feel like God is calling me to this place. I'm like, well, there's people that need to hear the Lord, maybe. So, we went to Santa Monica, California. And in Santa Monica, we realized that as good Adventists, all the fun that I was having uh, with social groups and Bible studies, we were neglecting the people that needed to hear the word. Because there were older people in Los Angeles that needed to hear about God, and we were we were having so much fun within ourselves with Adventists that we have forgotten the message to spread the gospel to every tribe and nation and everybody. So I said, let's go to Santa Monica. You think God is calling you there? I'll take the contract at Cedar Sinai. You take the contract at Long Beach, and we'll just find a middle ground. God took us there, right by the beach. We lived in a 400 square foot. 400 square foot. This is a full apartment. 400 square foot. We got rid of everything. We only have one couch, one bed, and like we we, uh, we decided when we move, we're just gonna fit whatever fits in our car, that's what we'll take. So it was such a tiny place, but we were happy because we knew that we were doing the, what the Lord had commanded us to do. Amen. So when we got to Santa Monica, we decided we're not here by coincidence. We're not gonna be idle. We're gonna go ahead and we need to do something about all of these people in the tent. You, one thing is that I tell you, and another thing is that you're there. When you see all of the rows of tents of homeless of people, homeless people, both rich and poor, encounter each other every day. It's such a sad, you go to the streets in Santa Monica, it's not a peaceful place, let me tell you. It's a beautiful place, but it's not peaceful. You go outside, go to the beach, you smell the smell marijuana everywhere, people with their loud music, it's a restless place. You couldn't even enjoy the beach on Sabbath because it's so crowded. But I'm like, Lord, 
Let's call out some friend from Loma Linda, I told Tim, and let's do God's word. God's word. So we decided to put a sign, free books, we offer prayer. Well, you, you'll be surprised because so many people from all backgrounds, rich, poor, homeless, now we're curious about what are those people? We have all kinds of books, Steps to Christ, Great Controversy, uh, health books, all kinds of books. People will stop and say, hey, what are you guys doing? Like, these three guys that you see on the left-hand side, they're from Michigan, and they were actually visiting. They prayed with us, they took all the books, especially the Great Controversy, Amen. and to this day I pray that the Lord had touched them with those books. Amen. And I said, Tim, are we to live here? Where are we to go? Where do we go from here? Do we go to Idaho? We thought we were going to Idaho, but for some reason the Lord Every Californian I know was going to Idaho, and people hated Californians in Idaho, apparently. So we're like, okay, God is closing doors there. What else to go? And Tim said, you remember that rainbow when we were driving from New Jersey and we passed to North Carolina? And that rainbow, I'm like, that's superstitious. Why do you think that rainbow is going to, it's like, I feel like God. I'm like, you know what? I feel like this. we did our research. I'm like, you know what? Let's put our deposit in our, in our department. Uh, let's apartment let's uh, ask the lord to help us and tim got five job offers like right, right, right. He, they flew him actually to greenville so he could see the hospital so we knew that god was opening doors right right open Amen. so i already read that go ahead to the next slide so how do i prepare for what is to come we're in north carolina now and we do not know what's going to happen. We're like, okay, God had us here. Look what it says in the spirit of prophecy. We must no longer remain upon the enchanted ground. We are fast approaching the close of our probation. Let every soul inquire, how do I stand before God? We know not how soon the names will be taken into the lips of Christ and our cases will be finally decided. Why, oh, what will these decisions be? Shall we be counted with the righteous, or shall we be numbered with the wicked? Number one, I was praying and asking God, I said, Lord, how do I prepare for this final crisis? The Bible says, according to Luke 21 and 36, prayer in the Holy Spirit. Jesus explicitly prescribed prayer as the key to standing in the end. Watch, therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all of these things that will come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. John 16, 13 says, however he, the spirit of truth, he will guide you into all truth. Ezekiel 36, 26 says, I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you the stony heart and give you a heart of flesh. Heaven, give the Holy Spirit to those who ask for him. Amen. So we need the Holy Spirit. Amen. We can pray for God to give us the Holy Spirit, but there's one thing. Ephesians 4, 29 and 32 says, Let not corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but only that which is edifying. Grieve not the Spirit of God, which ye are sealed by redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as Christ has forgiven you. Amen. God wants to give all of us the Holy Spirit. He wants all of us, and the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. But you have to make a choice and turn back. You have to decide, hey, I'm not going to be evil speaking about anyone. I'm not going to be bitter or angry or unforgiven. If someone has done anything to you in this place, if someone, a family member, a member of this church, anyone, you have to be forgiven. The disciples, uh, the disciples were in the room all together waiting for the holy spirit but they were in unity awaiting for it so we have to be all in unity awaiting for the holy spirit Amen. inspiration tells us he was in sleeping when jesus bade him watch and pray that peter had prepared the way for his great sin all the disciples by sleeping in that critical hour sustain a great loss what victory might be we be losing today because we are sleeping when god has called Amen. us to watch and pray 
And I cannot tell you what a blessing it is to have Sister Leanne and Sister Corinne praying for us every morning at 5 a.m. And even the days that I thought, man, I cannot, I have too much on my plate, I want to spend time. I felt more blessed when I actually joined than when I didn't, Amen. even though I was tired. It's Amen. such a blessing. Amen. So we have to pray more and speak less. The Bible says, okay, the Bible says, sanctify yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. The work can never be done by human effort. It must be wrought by a miracle as a result of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Not by my might, not by my power, but my, my, by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts, Zechariah 4, 6. There's nothing that Satan fears more so much that a people of God shall have cleared the way by removing every hindrance so that the Lord can pour out his spirit upon a languishing church in an impenitent congregation. If Satan had his way, there would be no other awakening, great or small, to the end of time. But we are, we are not ignorant of his devices. It is possible to resist his power when, we, when the way is prepared for the Holy Spirit, the blessings will come. Amen. Amen. Leviticus, we know that we are living in the great day of atonement. What they were doing in the great day of atonement, what were they doing? They were watching and praying. They were afflicting their souls. They were avoiding drunkenness. All personal work was laid aside. And the cares of this life were not to come in and crowd God's work. So, number two. So number one, we know that we're going to pray and ask for the Holy Spirit. Number two, we need to spread the angel's message. The angel's message. You guys know what the angel's message is? Uh -huh. Go ahead. What, what, what's the angel's message? I used to hear, Fear what's the three God. angel's message? What's the three angel's message? Fear God. Yes. And give glory to him. Right. For the hour. Yes. What is it? What is it? You guys tell me. You guys, you guys tell me. What What three components? Judgment. Babylon. It's about Babylon and it's about worship, right? Who are you worshiping? The God. judgment of God and all of that. But before we can present with power, the three angels' message to the world. They need to see that there's something different in ourselves, in our lives. We cannot present this without one key, one key element of the Holy Spirit. Love. Love, brothers and sisters. Love underlies true obedience. It is a supreme guiding principle of the converted. Without love, there's no Christianity. Listen to that. Without love, there's no Christianity. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, because God is love. Love can transform the life. Love eliminates selfishness and creates, instead of generosity, benevolence and interest and the well-being of others. And let me ask you this morning, are you interested in the well-being of others? Amen. Are you considerate of other people's feelings? Are you considerate when someone calls you and you're so tired from work that you don't want to hear about anything? You're like, oh, I don't want to talk to anyone. Are you concerned about your brother's or sister's burden? Or do they bug you? Just think of those, think of those things because love is the principle that guides all Christian Christianity. And love continues. Love cancels any resentment. Love cancels envy and jealousy. He replaces them with kindness forbearance and cordiality. It dispels contention and disloyal strife. It kills selfish ambition. It neutralizes hatred. It dispels fear and distrust. Together with faith in Christ's pardon for sin, love is the best treatment for ills of the spirit, the best solution for emotional problems, and with a powerful medicine for all psychosomatic diseases. So love, I have seen in my um, in my hospital, that many times when actually patients, when they were treated with love and kindness, when they were surrounded with their family members or their church members, those patients would heal faster. Those patients that felt forgiven, that felt free, that will feel faster, and the ones that have no one, that felt guilty, that felt that they have nothing to live for, they would die faster. And I'm like, wow, this is so powerful. Our love is so powerful. 
And when, when you're feeling guilty, when you're feeling, God knows. God knows it's a problem of guilt. God knows it's a problem of sin. And God knows that although there's other people, we are all sinners and we all have fallen short to the glory of God. And when we look down on people that drink and smoke and do all of the things, but we, there's pridefulness in our heart, God condemns that as well. So when we see those people, let's show them that we care. Amen. This is an example here of how Jesus began his ministry. In Jesus, we have the example of Jesus, how he spread the three angels' message, right? First, he has love. Second, he began his ministry with a small group of people. According to Matthew 4, 18, 22, if you want to read it, you can. I won't read it. And Luke 6, 13, and 16, he picked 12 disciples. Have you ever wondered why Jesus picked 12 disciples? Have you ever wondered why he picked 12 disciples? He picked 12 disciples because according to Kurt W. Johnson in the book Small Groups, Small Groups from Theory to Service, sociologists said that 12, after 12 people, the dynamics of a close group change. There's no more closeness. There's no more bond. It gets this distraction. 12 is like the perfect number to keep the bond together. So Jesus spent time with his small group of disciples. He bonded with them. He instructed them. He prayed with them. And he took them with him to observe how he ministered to others. So Jesus... Okay, so after Jesus ascended to heaven, we have the example of the early church. And I love the early church. I don't know if you guys, I'm pretty sure all of you guys, how many of you guys have read Acts 2? All of you guys have read Acts 2, right? Acts 2 is a wonderful, wonderful, um, wonderful uh, chapter in the Bible. And first, what did they do first? And I love this. I'm getting, um, I forgot to quote him. But this is from the book um, Brother Oral gave us small groups from theory to service he talks about the groups he talks about how god organized the groups and how the acts church was organized it's a wonderful book if you haven't read it i highly recommend you start reading it so first the believers were devoted to bible study second there was love there was care there was nurturing they broke bread together they prayed together they experienced miracles and conversions and healing from the dead and people eventually were baptized. And we saw in the picture of the video that Oro showed us how they are experiencing miracles together and conversions and healing because they have all come together to preach the word of God. Amen. So how do we get organized to spread the three angels message? How do we get organized for the second part of the, of, of, of our, um, of the preparation for this final crisis? We have to have structure to do this. We have to have sometimes a pastor or a supporter, a vision leader, a lay leader, and a coach uh, that oversees a uh, maximum of 10 units. And I explain to you guys uh, later on how this works. Well, this I got this from the book that Oro uh, gave. So a healthy group has a group leader. It has a seeker, which is the person. It could be your neighbor. It could be your friend. The seeker could be anyone. It has an assistant group leader. It has a host. You have an extra care required person because that extra care required person, in case someone is going through something, someone's going through sickness, someone's going to trial, someone requires prayer, you have this person. You have a growing new Christian and you have an open seat just in case you have new members coming. So why do we need to get organized? Why do we need to get organized? Can we just come to church and, you know, just do it as we can and let's just... You know what? Let's worship God. Let's not. God has given us special instruction in the Old Testament of how the, is how the Israelites had large, medium, and small group relationships. The nation was composed of groups and subgroups, and then the tribes, and then tribes, and then the tribes were divided into clans, and then the clans were divided into families, and then the families, they were individual family, individual houses, right? God's church today need to have good leadership that is organized at each level of structure. If the church overlooks any of these groups, it will suffer its mission, according to Kirk W. Johnson. Small, I didn't put the quote there, I apologize. So, okay. So 
This is not a new concept. The largest church in the wilderness was the church of Pastor Moses, right? <laughs> Pastor Moses, you guys know how many people his church was composed of? He says there's 600,000 plus men, but you guys, can you guys guess how many people he had in total? Or like, can you guys, do you guys know from the Bible how many people he had? So millions. Two million. Two million, okay? No wonder he said, I can't, how can I bear the, your problems, your burdens, your complaints? This is what it is important for all of the members to assist in ministry because you don't want to overburden certain people. Moses organized a, organized a unit of 10 people with, with a leader. Following this organizational steps, led them to the promised land. First was Moses, and then it ended up with Joshua. All right. So once we get organized, and we have, we spread the three angels' message, we have our group in our setting. What do we do next? Well, Jesus always put people together before structure and tradition. His goal was relationships. He told the disciples, if someone wants to be a leader, he must deny themselves. Right? They must put others to serve him before others. A leader must be willing to serve others and give up selfish goals and desires, according to um, the Bible and successful groups, theory to service. In addition, Jesus told his disciples to leave the principles of the kingdom, not to police the rules of the kingdom. In every church, people should be number one priority. Members should not participate in group to life group life to fix one another. That's the role of the Holy Spirit. The members are to learn and live, live the scripture and support and pray for one another. All right. And then we can see a picture here. It's another small group. Um, I miss I miss my friends, but I have new friends here. Amen. Amen. Uh, these are dear friends to us. We spend Christmas with them. And um, there's another part of another care group. And um, we enjoy our blessed time with them. That's my brother, uh, Tim, and uh, I think my, my friend Mariela has joined us sometimes in Bible study. So we had a blessed, blessed time. Um, it says that the mass meetings and the home meetings not only provided support and fellowship and social life, but this was a setting for soul winning, winning a cure when people were baptized. Some say, oh, the purpose of small groups is to uh, meet social needs. This is true, but in Acts 2, all uh, were produced the decision for Jesus. If your small group is not reaching out to the unchurched as part of its format, then your group is not following the God-given principles found in Acts 2. So what can you do? What can you do to participate in a small group? Well, you can invite your friends, you can invite your hairdresser. Everyone, make uh, printed invitations. If you can start um, attending your care group, start one. If it is too, um, if it is too far away and you cannot come to a care group, start your own. Invite your neighbors and family. Ask God to give you ideas of how to invite people. All right. So now we have number three. Embrace the health message. Embrace the health message. And I don't know where the rest of the congregation went, uh, but this is very important. This is extremely important. The health reform. Do you guys know what health reform is? I know that you guys have learned, many of you have heard this over and over and over again. What's health reform, health reform, health reform? Sister White, in a vision, was shown that the part of the three angels message is a part of the three angels message and is closely connected as arm and human body as so that we as the people of god should make an advance move in this great work ministers and people must act in concert god's people are not prepared we are not prepared for the third angel they have a work to do for themselves which they should not leave god to do for them he had left this work for them to do it's an individual work the other thing, gluttony. Gluttony is a prevailing sin of this age. Lustful appetite makes slaves of men and women and beclouds their intellect and stupefies their moral sensibilities to such degree that you cannot appreciate the elevated truths of God's word. The lower propensities have ruled men and women. 
And we know, according to the University of Pennsylvania, I mean, they were doing a study for 38 years. University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Templeton, David Templeton. Um, they were doing a study of, between the connection of stomach and brain, brain and stomach. And for 38 years, in 2016, they discovered, yes, the connection, you know, stress, you know, you can get H. pylori, and there's actually receptors in your stomach that are neuroreceptors. Um, you have certain hormones that are neurotransmitters, which is serotonin and norepinephrine and uh, dopamine and all of these neurotransmitters, you actually have them in your stomach. So what you eat is gonna affect how you feel. It's gonna affect how you perceive the word of God. And we, when we come here to church and we uh, indulge in our appetite, it's very, very, very hard to discern the truths that God has for us. So number three, embrace the health message. Yield not to temptation, says Sister White. To everyone who's tempted to indulge the appetite, I would say, yield not to temptation, but confine yourself to the use of wholesome, wholesome foods, flesh foods, tea and coffee. Those who have received instruction regarding these evils, she called them evils, tea, coffee, flesh foods, rich, unhealthy preparations, who are determined to make a covenant with God will not continue to undurge the appetite for food that they know to be not to be, un to be unhelpful. God demands that our appetites be cleansed and that self-denial be practiced in regard to those things which are not good. This is a work that will, be, will have to be done before his people can stand before him in a, uh, can stand before him a perfect people. That render of God must be a converted people. The presentation of this message is to result in conversion and sanctification. We are to feel the power of God, the spirit of God in this movement. This is a wonderful message that people will receive. She said people will receive this message with open arms. And brothers and sisters, I realize some of these things are hard for people and members of the church. It's like, well, why do I have to follow that? I can do whatever I want. Um, it doesn't really matter. In LA, in Los Angeles, in Hollywood, I went to so many vegan restaurants that were new age. People what were actors and actresses, new, new age, embracing these messages. When we have been given this for about 200 years, you know? And people are realizing the benefits, non-Adventists, secular people on a plant-based diet. So why can we accept? So do we accept part of the testimonies? Do we accept part of it and not all of it? My brothers and sisters, if you're gonna accept we're going to embrace, embrace the health message and accept the spirit of prophecy as of God. I think we should accept all of it and follow her counsels. And this is not so much, why do we need to do this? Because our frontal, as my, my husband has said, our frontal lobe, you know, it's a communication, direct communication with God. So the world should come to us now with impelling, impelling earnestness. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. There are among us uh, those who are deficient in spirituality and who unless they're wholly converted will be lost. Can you afford the risk? You may ask, this is too hard for me. How can I give up my burgers and my pizza and, and all of my, you know, whatever you're struggling with? The power of Christ alone can work the transformation in the heart. Amen? Amen? The power of Christ alone can work the transformation in the heart and mind. That we must all experience uh, Him, a new life in His kingdom. So, point number four. Last point. Last point. Know the scriptures for yourself. Know the scriptures for yourself. The Bible says in Isaiah 8.20, to the law and the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is not because there's no light in them. And if there's no light, there's darkness. And darkness is for the enemies. At every revival of God's word, the prince of evil is aroused to more intense activity as we saw this morning. We saw him attacking us this morning, people logging in and cursing at us. And we're like, what in the world? The devil must be angry. We don't know what's going on. Satan is constantly, 
constantly endeavoring to attract attention to man in the place of God. He leads people to live, uh, look to bishops and pastors and professors of theology as their guide instead of searching the scriptures to learn their duty for themselves. Then by controlling the mind of these leaders, he can influence the multitudes to do his will. Those who endeavor to obey all the commandments of God will be opposed. We know we're going to be opposed for believing the Bible. We know that that's going to come to a time that we're going to have to stand individually on your own for your own beliefs. So what are we to do? Shall we obey God rather than man? What are we to do? This is the hour. Are we planted in the word? Are you prepared for stand, to stand firm in defense of the commandments of God? The Apostle Paul declared that the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. We are in that time right now. Their people are not enduring sound doctrine. Second Timothy 4 3 says that multitudes do not want Bible truth because it interferes with a simple world loving desire. And Satan supplies a deception. But God will have a people upon the earth to maintain the Bible and the Bible only as a standard of all doctrines and the basis of all reforms. Amen. He's constantly endeavoring to attract attention to man in place of God. There's a way that seems right into a man, but the way there are the ways of death. Ignorance. Listen to what the Spirit of Prophecy says. Ignorance is no excuse for error or sin when there's every opportunity to know the will of God. In conclusion, you're ending. The Spirit of Prophecy says that many are deceived as to the true conditions before God. They congratulate themselves upon the wrong acts which they do not commit and forget to enumerate the good and noble deeds which God requires of them, but they have neglected. He holds them accountable for the failure to accomplish all the good which they could have done through His grace. Through His grace, not our own, but through His grace. With those who have slighted God's mercy and abused His grace, His heart of long-suffering love yet pleads. Pleads. Wherefore he said, Awaken thou sleepest, thou sleepest, arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee life. See then that ye walk circumspectly, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Amen. Brothers and sisters, the word is here before us, as the spirit of prophecy says. Are you going to engage in the word? Will we engage in God's word? We must fast, work fast. Steadily forward, we must be preparing for the great day of the Lord. We have no time to lose. No time to be engaged in selfish purposes. The world is to be warned. What are we doing as individuals to bring the light before us? God has left every man his work. Everyone has a part to act. And we cannot neglect this work except at the perils of our own soul. The last one here. The Spirit is poured out only with the heart is ready to receive him. And I hope our hearts are ready to just receive Jesus this morning. When sanctification is complete, when sin has, sins have been confessed and forsaken, when self is dead, when the spirit of supremacy is banished, when meekness and humility and full consecration characterize believers. Mm -hmm. The Lord has commanded us, go ye into all world and preach the gospel to every creature. In each of us, to each of us, he says, go ye unto all the vineyard, Matthew 24. And he talks about the parable of all the talents. And when we are waiting for the coming of the Lord, we must not be idle, as Brother Paul said in uh, the Sabbath school, but acting in the world, making use of the talents that he has entrusted us. The Lord requires us to use our minds, our legs, our voices, our whole being to finishing the work of the harvest so that the Savior may soon return. Sanctified lives and diligent activity will convert into reality the most cheering God's promises, affording the greatest satisfaction to those who have been faithful instruments in the Master's hand. So are you willing to ask God, to pray and ask God for His Holy Spirit today? Are you willing to spread the three angels' message through small groups to get organized as we, we have been shown as Moses, they were organized, and we're willing to organize care groups so we can reach out our communities, so we can reach out all the people. Are you willing to embrace the health message so you can have a sharp mind, and you can communicate, and God can communicate the wonderful truths of his word to you? And the last one, are you willing 
to know the scripture for yourself and to memorize the Bible and not to be clouded, not to cloud your mind with Netflix and, and all these things that are like all these series and all these apps and your phone. Is your phone sending you to hell? I heard a pastor saying that. Sometimes our phones are so much a distraction that we forget that, hey, wake up. If your phone is, is actually a distraction for you, hey, change to a flip phone. Is that a, is that a hindrance for you? What is your hindrance this morning? And I want to have a special prayer of consecration this morning for all of us at Upendo, that we take this message to heart. I'm not talking to anyone specific here, but I believe the Holy Spirit has uh, put this for me together to share this morning. So we all we all have a part to do, and we all have a work to do in our in our. God has a work to do in all of us in our lives. Amen. So let's go ahead and have prayer. And if you're able and willing, and you like God to actually take control of your life, I want to ask you to stand up with me. And if you want a special prayer, you can actually stand uh, right here. And I would like to pray for you. You wanna you want special prayer. You want people to. Help you get rid of all the worldliness, all the worldly thoughts and actions and all those things. And you want to say, yes, Lord, I want to consecrate myself to you in every aspect of my life. Every single aspect. Even those that I do not know. Give me your spirit so I know where I need to work on. Let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your Holy Sabbath, for your Holy Spirit, Lord, and for helping us this morning. I ask for a special, special blessing upon your congregation, Lord. I ask a special blessing upon, especially Tim and, Ma Tim and Malik, who had um, acknowledged you, Lord, and have requested, Lord, special help from you. All of us need your help, Lord. But I ask in a special way for Malik and Tim, Lord, that you bless them, that you remove all the spirit of the devil away from this congregation, Lord, that you remove any hindrance from our life, Lord, and that you help us to be fully consecrated fully empty ourselves so we can receive the Holy Spirit. So our mind is not so clouded, Lord, with the things of the world that we are not able to see and receive the Holy Spirit. Lord, let us not be like the ten full, like the five full virgins, but help us be like the wise virgins that had the oil of the Holy Spirit. I thank you so much in your name. Amen. Amen. Amen.